sometimes you have missing data in the dependent variable and the missingness depends on the actual missing value. For example, if you study the wages of, of people, whether you actually observe a wage for a person might depend on the wage that the person was offered and then the person declined the job. In this case, selection models can be useful. The most commonly used and well-known selection model is the one introduced by James Heckman in 1976 and 1979 papers that won him the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2000. How does the Heckman selection work and what kind of assumptions does it make? Let's take a look. So Heckman selection model and selection models more, selection models more generally address the missing not at random case. So uh, the worst case scenario in missing data is when you have missingness in the dependent variable and the actual whether the observation is missing or not depends on, on the value that is missing. So if the missingness depends on the value that is missing, then of course we can't test what is the missing data mechanism. So this must be assumed based on theory. For example, if y here is, is the weight that a person was offered and uh, then we observe only those people who decided to, to uh, accept the job, we could infer based on theory that if a person is offered a very low wage, then that person uh, would rather stay at home, for example, to take care of the kids or stay at home and enjoy unemployment benefits or some other reason. So this is the, the scenario that the Heckman selection model addresses. When Heckman's selection model is used, uh, you can see a couple of terms appear in papers. So uh, this is not a good example of how the Heckman selection work is. Heckman selection model is applied, but it shows you the key terms. You can see citations to 1979 paper, you can see the word Heckman, and uh, you can see uh, the word inverse Mills ratio. So what is, uh, who is Mills, why is uh, the ratio, and uh, why do we take an inverse? Normally in a selection model you uh, run this kind of equation. So you have two equations in a selection model. So you have the selection equation, this example comes from, from Ender's book, and then you have the main model. So in Ender's book we have um, IQ explaining uh, job performance and then we have well-being predicting on, on whether that person stays in the job or not. So we have one equation that tells us or tries to explain if we observe the value of the dependent variable for a person and another model that tries to explain the differences in the, in the dependent variable controlling for the fact that some of those values were not observed. And how this, this works is that uh, we must make the assumption that the error terms of these two models are normally distributed. And we assume that they are correlated. So, so whatever uh, causes job performance also causes uh, the missingness. So this is basically uh, that an unobserved variable, unobserved part or the error term of job performance also correlates with the selection. And this selection model is, is a probit model. And the idea of a probit model is that the, uh, the uh, job performance data is observed if this uh, predicted value plus the error term zeta is greater than zero. So at this point it's a good idea to recap what the probit model was about. And uh, the idea of a probit model was that uh, we estimate a linear prediction first. So here's our linear prediction, we call it Y star. And uh, this, this is like a normal regression model. And then we add a normally distributed error term to the uh, linear prediction like we do in the regression analysis. And instead of observing that Y star directly, we observe uh, one if Y star is greater than zero and we observe zero otherwise. And here uh, one is that the person was uh, observed and zero indicates that there is missing data for that person. So this is briefly uh, the probit model and if you don't know probit model then you should probably look at another video where I explain this model in detail. Why we use the probit model be will become clear pretty soon. So let's be get back to the selection model. 
And let's use an example. And this example comes from Status User Manual. This is an, a way to implement the selection model using status adrenalized structural ecosystem modeling. We will not be using general structural ecosystem modeling in example, but this is a nice path diagram and nice data set that um, shows what we are going to do. So um, we are explaining the wages of, of people, women in this case, and uh, how the wages depend on age, education and age. The problem is that if a person was offered a low wage, they would uh, choose not to work. And this is the, uh, the problem that Heckman addresses when he was developing the selection model. We also have a selection equation and we think that the whether a person decides to work or not depends on whether they're married or not and whether they have children or not. We could for example theorize that a person who has many children needs more money and therefore is more likely to work. We could also theorize that a person who has many children would uh, favor staying at home with the kids instead of going to work depending on uh, what kind of benefits you get uh, for having kids from the government in, in the society where you live. But anyway, we think that, uh, that whether you're married, whether you have kids affects uh, whether you go to work or not. And we also think that the marriage or the number of kids will not affect how much money you are offered for a job. And it would be illegal for that to uh, matter, at least in Finland where I live. So we run a regression model or Heckman selection model using this data. So these are artificially generated data by this data. And we get two sets of estimates. We get uh, the wage equation. This is the, uh, the equation of interest. And we get the selection equation. And uh, this selection equation is simply a probit model. So we can see that um, if you're married or if you have kids, you're more likely to work. And uh, age has an effect. If you're older, you're more likely to work. If you have higher education, you're more likely to work. And then now this, this wage education here controls for the, uh, the selection effect. So how, how does this actually work? And let, let's take a look how it works. And here's the selection model again. So we have, um, this is from, from Ender's book. So we have job performance, the dependent variable. We think well-being uh, explains whether you actually stay at job or not. And we think that well-being does not affect job performance. And we think that IQ does not affect uh, selection. Normally we would, we would regress selection on IQ because that's, that's how the thing is done. I'll get to that a bit later, but let's take a look at the basic idea. So um, the idea here is that uh, we, we try to control for zeta. So uh, if we could control for zeta somehow, then uh, this epsilon would be uncorrelated with the selection. So that, that's, the, that's the key insight here. This uh, selection is, is kind of like an omitted variable problem. If we can come up with the right control variable, then uh, the epsilon after controlling for, for the right control variable will be uncorrelated with the selection. So the key problem here is that we need to estimate the zeta here. And, and how, do we, how do we go about doing it? How do we estimate zeta? And this is where the, the probit model and the normal distribution assumption becomes important. So the idea of a probit model was that uh, we observe a one if this equation here is uh, a y star is greater than zero and we observe a zero or we don't observe the, uh, the dependent variable there is missingness if, if this equation is less than zero. And how does it work? So uh, we have linear prediction. So we have uh, betas times the observed predictors in the selection model. We call it xb. And, uh, if the linear prediction is A, then we know that uh, the zeta must have a value of at least minus A. So for example, in this case, the fitted value of the linear prediction is, is minus one. We know that then zeta must receive at least uh, the value of one for that case to be observed. And then uh, the area on the right hand side of the normal curve gives the probability of actually observing the case. Also, if we know that zeta is at least minus a, then we need to uh, 
calculate what is the expected value of, of zeta. So if we know that zeta must be at least one, so, so this is the normal distribution, zero is here centered at, at minus one, and this is plus one standard deviation above the mean. So if we know that zeta is, is a plus one standard deviation, then what is the expected value of zeta? So, so we basically know that there are, if we observe a case, then zeta did not receive any of these values. So we didn't receive value, get, it didn't get any of the values that are, are below one. It must have gotten a value above one. So assuming that the value is above one for zeta in this case, what is the expected value of zeta? So we basically um, would have to integrate over this normal distribution, this part, and, the, and that would give us the mean. So we don't actually have to do the integration because uh, the expected value or, or the mean of, of this data is given by this kind of equation. So it's the, uh, basically uh, what this quantifies is the ratio of, of this probability density, so the height of the normal curve at the cutoff point, divided by the area under the curve. And uh, A is the, uh, the predictive, uh, so A is the, uh, the value of that we need and 1 minus a is this area on the right hand side of the, of the curve. The reason for that is that the cumulative distribution gives us the area on the left hand side of the cutoff, so 1 minus the cumulative distribution is the right hand side. There are different ways of, uh, of cal calculating or expressing this quantity known as uh, inverse Mills ratio. So why is it uh, inverse Mills ratio? Well, uh, there's a statistician called Mills who worked on the ratio of, of probability density, probability, cumulative probability and uh, divided by probability density. So that's Mills ratio that, and uh, this is just the opposite of, of the same ratio. So Mills was working on, on the ratios of probability, cumulative probability divided by probability density and we are dividing probability density by cumulative probability. So, and there is not, not much more to that. So there is like, uh, if you want to know where this comes from, you need to study statistics, but I don't think that understanding where this comes from is very useful for an applied researcher. It's a bit unfortunate that the name inverse Mills ratio is used in applied papers. I would think that, uh, for example, expected zeta would be a lot more descriptive of, of, of what the uh, inverse Mills ratio actually quantifies. Let's take a look at, at how this works in a bit more detail to try to understand what the Heckman selection model is doing. So this is uh, the profit model using the same data set. So we are running a profit model on selection on, on married children, education and age and this is the, the uh, profit coefficients. They are of course the same that we have in the selection model because we are estimating the same profit model. And uh, we will then take the predicted values, the fitted values, they are called XB. So X is the observed data, B is the regression coefficients. So observed predictors times regression coefficients is the predicted values. And um, here is the, the predicted value for a particular case. So for example, the first case, the predicted value is minus 0.69 and this case was not observed and so on. And then we have uh, mean, mean zeta. So I generated the value of mean zeta. And, and this is the value that the, the zeta must receive at least for this case to be observed. So, uh, and I only calculated it for, for the selective, the observed cases. We could of course calculate it for all cases, but I chose to just uh, calculate it for those cases that we observe because those are the ones that we use in the, in the main equation. So if the predicted value is minus 0.2, then zeta must receive a value of at least 0.2 for that case to be selected. So zeta is normally distributed with mean of zero and standard deviation of one. And uh, so if, if we require a positive value for zeta, we know that the probability for being selected is uh, less than 50%. And then the inverse Mills ratio tells what is the, uh, the expected value of, of zeta, given that we know that zeta must be at least 0.2. So this is the, uh, the idea. And let's take a look at the inverse Mills ratio a bit more. So uh, here is uh, the uh, a hypothetical zeta. So this is the distribution of, of zeta. 
and the gray area is, is those values that would cause the case to be selected. And if the, if the fitted value is very large, then uh, the case will be selected no matter what. So if the fitted value is, let's say, the linear prediction is 5, then pretty much any value of zeta that we add to 5, because zeta is standard normal distributed, will lead to uh, a value that is greater than 0 and therefore the case being selected. This red line gives us the, uh, the average or the expected value of zeta, assuming that zeta is, is greater than whatever cutoff we have. So we can see how the uh, inverse Mills ratio, the expected value, depends on, on the minimum required zeta. And this animation shows it that when we start increasing uh, the required zeta a bit, then we can see that the, uh, the mean or the, or the expected value of this uh, remaining zeta goes to the right, it, so it increases. And uh, this, this basically just demonstrates what the inverse Mills ratio quantifies. It quantifies the, uh, what is the expected value of those values of zeta that would cause the case to be selected. And we can see that as the required zeta increases, so does the, exp so does the inverse Mills ratio. In fact, if we take a look at the, the relationship between the linear prediction and the inverse Mills ratio, we can see that this is a, a decreasing function. So if the linear prediction is very large, if we uh, say that, okay, the linear prediction is 4, then pretty much any value of normal distribution would qualify and the expected value from the normal distribution is 0. So, it, so the uh, inverse Mills ratio is, is 0 as well. When uh, the, ex the predicted value goes to, uh, and it's highly negative, so exa for example, minus 4, then we need a, a very large value from zeta. Only, only the right hand tail of the zeta qualifies and produces y star that is greater than zero. So the relationship between the linear prediction and the profit model and inverse Mills ratio is here. And we can observe a couple of things. For uh, the, the xv, the linear prediction is of course a linear function of the observed variables. We can also see that for the most part, uh, inverse Mills ratio is approximately linear function of, of the prediction. So if we take, for example, from, from minus 2 to 2, then a line would be a pretty good approximation. And, and that is where most of the cases fall between plus and minus two standard deviations from the mean. So uh, the inverse Mills ratio is, is uh, close to a linear function of a weighted sum of the independent variables. And this, this causes a bit of a problem. So if we include the inverse Mills ratio from a probit model calculated using the same set of predictors that we use in the main model, it might work, but it would produce an extremely collinear model. So we would need a large number of observations and also the identification of our model would depend on the fact that this curves a little bit. And uh, justifying this kind of functional form would be very difficult based on theory. So in practice, we need to have instrumental variables to avoid this, this collinearity issue. So the collinearity issue uh, is, is avoided here in Ender's paper by having well-being being a predictor of selection but not a predictor, predictor of a job performance. So in practice you need to have these instruments in the Heckman selection model and uh, the, the reason why we need to have them is that otherwise the inverse, inverse Mills ratios will be perfectly or nearly perfectly correlated with uh, these um, predictors in the main equation. So if we have a very large sample size we could in theory estimate the IQ's effect, only IQ in the selection model and get this to actually run, but we would rely on the differences in the functional form linear here and probe it here for identification and that's uh, 
that's a bit tedious because we know that profit model is is roughly linear for a large part of the observations so we would rely on on the ends of the distribution for identification and that's challenging. In the status example we have two instruments so we think that uh, whether you're married whether you have kids they affect whether you go to work or not that's reasonable and uh, you're not supposed to these are not supposed to affect how much wages you get. In fact in many cases if you apply for a job you wouldn't tell the employer whether you're married or how many kids you have and therefore uh, there's no way that the wage that the employer offers you would depend on on marriage and children because that's not something that the employer would know. And these are instruments because they are uncorrelated with the wage determinants. So are these models useful? They are certainly widely used but there are some big caveats and, and these caveats are that the Heckman selection model is highly sensitive to the assumption that the selection follows the profit model. So you saw that when we calculate the inverse Mills ratio we use the normal density and the cumulative normal distribution for calculating the quantity. If those distributions actually don't characterize the selection process then the inverse Mills ratios or the expected values of zeta will be incorrect and the results will be widely misleading. There is some research that shows that the Heckman model's assumptions are actually very important. If the assumptions don't hold then it might be better to, to uh, just estimate the selection equation, estimate the, uh, the main equation with um, other missing data techniques that assume missing at random instead of trying these selection models. Nevertheless, these are very commonly used. People generally don't justify the assumptions and as justifying the assumptions would be very difficult to do based on theory because it is uh, difficult to uh, justify the functional form of things that we don't observe. How do we uh, justify that there is a, a strict cutoff for y star that we don't, we don't observe y star? How do we justify the zeta is normally distributed? We no, we pretty much can't. So because of that some uh, methodological sources say, say that these should be used more as a, a sensitivity analysis. So we could do a, sele a normal model with missing at random techniques such as multiple imputation or maximum likelihood for missing data and, and then do a selection model then compare the results and say that okay so the first set of results shows there are estimated effects assuming the missing data mechanism is MAR and the second set assuming that there is a normally distributed selection process. We of course don't know if either of these assumptions are, are true but that would give us some kind of ballpark estimates of where the effects might be. So Heckman selection model while it's a very useful conceptually there are some empirical challenges that make it uh, less useful than what it seems. And that's one of the reasons why for example Ender's book takes a rather dim view, dim view on these selection models.